I grew up in Albuquerque. I was born in Roswell, actually, but when I was two years old, luckily, we moved to Albuquerque. Huh. If you've been to Roswell, you know what I mean. And my father uh, started college there uh, when I was two years old, and uh, he was the youngest of seven. He was the only one to graduate from high school, um, and he, he had two sisters who came out to Los Angeles in the 1960s, late 1960s. Their husbands had jobs in the refinery, um, which at the time were good jobs. Now they're, they're not good jobs because they're contracted out and they're on good benefits and such. But at that time, those were really good jobs. And they went to a town that those of you in Southern California, um, well, some of you from Southern California will know, it's, it's Wilmington the town of Wilmington, which is right near the refineries. And there was this entire cluster of people from Roswell, Chicanos from Roswell, who'd moved to Wilmington. And uh, they, they brought good things from New Mexico, and they brought bad things from New Mexico. Um, my, one of my uncles was killed uh, in a gang shooting uh, at, in his 40s there in Wilmington. Uh, my cousins did not, except for the ones who were younger than me, did not graduate from high school here in Southern California. Uh, this isn't ancient times, this is recently. Um, one of my cousins, uh, Freddy Romero, is now in San Quentin, uh, thanks to the three strikes law and thanks to a drug habit that was not seen as sympathetic the way people are seen today as, as sympathetic, or at least some people are seen today as sympathetic and needing help rather than incarceration. And so, um, you know, I grew up always wondering, well, what, what was it that made, you know, those families, the experiences of my Thea Virgi and my Thea Dorothy's families so different than, than my experience? And in some ways, I think that's what led me to study sociology and, and, you know, just continue thinking about these questions. And I, I wanted to share that story, that those, those recollections, just as a way of, of um, situating our conversation today. And this panel is um, all about situating. It's a, little, it's a panel that will take a bit of a broader look um, at, at the topics. We're sort of setting the table for a uh, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary context. And we have four wonderful, wonderful uh, scholars to share some of their thoughts with us. So our first speaker is my colleague and friend, Matthew Alejandro Barreto, who is um, a UCLA professor uh, in the political science and the Chicano Studies departments. He has... Um, I, you've probably heard him on the radio or seen him on TV. Um, he studies Latinos in politics, quite an interesting and fascinating topic now. I would just mention two of his books. His 2010 book, uh, which was, was very important to me in my thinking about uh, Latino politics, Ethnic Cues, The Role of Shared Ethnicity in, um, in Latino Political Participation. And then his book in 2014 with um, UCLA's Dean of the Luskin School of Public Affairs, Gary Segura, um, Latino Amer America, How America's Most Dynamic Population is po Poised to Transform the Nation. Um, very influential works and, and just a, the tip of the iceberg of his work. And then our second speaker is going to be Professor Victoria Plout, um, who comes to us from our neighbor to the north, UC Berkeley. Uh, Victoria is a psychologist by training and has, has an amazing body of work that looks at implicit bias, looks at, at, at whites' racial attitudes, looks at attitudes towards immigrants, and she has also applied some of this work in her work as on the University of uh, California Berkeley campus and the law school campus in terms of diversity initiatives. Um, our third speaker is um, our own Kelly Lytle Hernandez, Hernandez, who is here at UCLA. She is the director of the Bunch Center for African American Research and also a professor of history and a professor of African American studies. Um, I take special 
special uh, pride in telling you about her first book because it grew out of her dissertation and I was on her committee. Mm -hmm. um, the dissertation, the book is Migra, A History of the U.S. Border Patrol, and I commend it to all of you. That book came out in 2010, and then her newest book in 2017 is entitled City of Inmates, Conquest, Rebellion, and the Rise of Human Caging in Los Angeles. And then, uh, certainly, um, last but not least, is Professor Nicole Gonzalez Van Cleve, uh, a professor of sociology and criminal justice at the University of Delaware. I have known Christine. Uh, I've known Nicole for um, quite now 15 years, maybe. And you know, I feel like she was uh, one of the the young ones uh, coming up in. Uh, in the Law and Society Association. And her book, her 2016 book, has won tremendous acclaim and deserved attention. I recommend it highly. It's called Crook County, Racism and Injustice in America's Largest Criminal Court. And it really is a must read study. So with that, I will um, allow you to begin, Matt. Thank you. Right, you want to come up here or just Whatever you are comfortable with. You just want to do. I, and people can do what they, people can do either or. Yeah, I'm going to stay here. Maybe okay. that'll be easier yeah. to sort of move around. And then uh, thank you, uh, Laura, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I had the pleasure of working um, with uh, Professor Gomez when she was the uh, dean of the social sciences division on some initiatives here to grow and advance our uh, Latino and underrepresented faculty. And she was a very, very strong supporter uh, in that, and I will always continue to acknowledge her for that because you have to have people in leadership positions to make that happen. So thank you, uh, Laura, for, for your work with us on that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, two projects uh, that I'm working on that I think are uh, relevant to this discussion that will hopefully open up a, a larger discussion. Uh, and one is with uh, a good friend of mine who's here uh, in the audience who you're going to hear from later, uh, Juan Cartagena from Latino Justice Pearl Def. Uh, we did about a year and some change ago um, one of the first large national surveys of Latino views towards the criminal justice system uh, with uh, Juan's organization. I'm just going to give you a couple of highlights of that uh, and what we found when we, uh, for one of the first times, asked not just one or two questions, but an entire uh, questionnaire about what do Latinos, how do they perceive, how are they being acted upon uh, in the criminal justice system, and it was quite revealing. Uh, from that came um, a series of work uh, with some colleagues and some additional surveys uh, and public opinion understanding of Latinos in which uh, we're now doing work trying to understand how it um, leads to a sense of mobilization. Uh, and uh, so I'll conclude with that, and that is um, hopefully a part of the work that um, and we'll be contributing to the uh, law review effort on how these interactions with the criminal justice system, while quite significant and severe, can also lead to a sense of mobilization by others in the community to take action uh, and get involved. Uh, so let me just start with um, uh, some highlights of, of what we found in our, our first uh, finding. Uh, the first was that, and this was in November of 2017, so almost exactly one year after the 2016 election had taken place. Uh, the first thing that we found was that uh, Latinos were significantly concerned about their public safety, uh, that they felt both acted upon as uh, regular victims of crime, that there was, there was a lot of crime in our neighborhoods, in our communities, uh, but also acted upon by the criminal justice system uh, through harassment, violence, and other means. And so it was this uh, double-edged sword, uh, so to speak, in which uh, both we wanted to uh, have police protections uh, from crime that was happening in our communities, uh, but a high rate of people saying they couldn't necessarily trust uh, the police, and so they were doubly concerned about their public safety with nowhere uh, to turn, so to speak. What added a level of complexity to this, which most of you are all uh, surely aware of, was the, level, uh, was the issue of immigration and how that was leading more distrust, especially in the first year of the Trump administration in Latino communities being concerned <clears throat> about reaching out to police because of uh, immigration issues and immigration status issues, which may cause them uh, to feel at risk uh, during those interactions, especially in some counties where there was active cooperation uh, between ICE. Um, in particular, Latinos identified in this survey that they felt uh, less safe around not just uh, police and law enforcement, uh, but in non-Latino communities, especially in white communities, because of what they perceived to be elevated 
uh, discrimination and rhetoric against immigrant and Latino communities in the years since Trump had been elected. So this was something that was confounding that. If we think about the normal criminal justice issues that uh, our communities have been, um, have been affected by over uh, the last 40 years or even just the last 10 years, this was now being compounded by the increased rhetoric and support for seemingly very anti-immigrant policies that people were feeling. They were feeling that not just from um, uh, police and the national government, but also just in, in their uh, society, when people were making comments uh, and laughing and, and taking expense. In terms of policies of support, uh, we found very strong support for a uh, progressive and rehabilitative approach to criminal justice. When given people a range of issues of what were the most important issues that needed to be addressed in the Latino community from a criminal justice perspective, uh, more rehabilitation programs was listed far and away, no matter how we asked the question, whether it was just by itself or uh, in combination with other uh, items, was far and away, uh, three to one, four to one, the single biggest um, improvement that people wanted to see. Not more uh, spending on jails, not more spending on police departments, not more spending on gear, but more spending on rehabilitation programs. And so that was something that we took away as being very important that we need to work on. Uh, a final important finding from this survey that I thought was that when asked uh, what communities were uh, most at risk in police engagement with uh, the criminal justice system, Latinos, uh, recognize that African Americans uh, perhaps were at the highest end of uh, police misconduct, police violence. But 64% of our respondents to our survey also perceived that police treated Latinos with the exact same amount of disrespect uh, or violence as African Americans. So it was perceived in the community, the community that was feeling it, that this was also happening uh, in places uh, where there were large uh, Latino populations and that for many in our community they were seeing the same level of uh, crackdown and, um, and, and violence. Um, finally, let me transition in and maybe leave you with a, a little bit of a more uh, optimistic sense of where we might be able to go from here. Uh, in looking at this uh, data and in looking in other data uh, with some other colleagues, and I should mention that uh, the survey that I mentioned that we did uh, in collaboration with uh, Latino Justice was led uh, by one of my colleagues at Arizona State University, uh, Professor Edward Vargas, who studies issues of uh, undocumented communities, criminal justice, uh, and uh, their relationship. Uh, and uh, there's much more uh, that can be said about this uh, that Edward has published on. But as a result of this, we, start, we wanted to look at a very specific uh, idea because we started to find that some of the people who were reporting these mistreatments, who said that they knew someone who had been uh, harassed by the police wrongly, who knew someone in particular who had been detained for criminal justice and immigration issues, we started to notice that these people reported a very high sense of what we called systemic injustice. And this is work that I'm doing uh, with a professor at Rutgers named Hannah Walker, uh, who studies uh, communities of color and the criminal justice system. And what we found were people who were reporting those interactions had a higher sense of political engagement and a higher sense of mobilization that they were taking action. We already have been seeing this in the African-American community with Black Lives Matters and other activist groups, that while those uh, interactions with the criminal justice system were quite negative for um, those affected and those being put behind bars, that it was creating this sense of empowerment and mobilization for those immediately surrounding, uh, those uh, brothers and sisters and um, primos and tias and the others in the community who knew someone were taking action, they were going to protest, they were writing letters, they were getting involved, they were participating at higher rates, whether it was in marches and demonstrations or actually voting uh, and, and taking action. And so we wanna continue to trace this and to see what um, legacy or what impacts there are down the road, how we can continue to capitalize on that and keep people organized and mobilized around that issue so that that issue doesn't fade, so that there is a strong activist community that can come and participate on this and so uh, these are some of the issues that we'll be addressing, specifically looking at that role of people who know others who have been uh, wrongly detained or deported related to criminal justice and immigration issues and how that might create and spark a sense of activism and uh, political participation. And this is, uh, I can be happy to talk about more. That's what we'll be hopefully contributing to, to the law review effort. So I'm gonna leave it at there. I'm about out of time. Thank you and, and pass it on to my other panelists. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to the faculty, 
organizers, uh, the UCLA staff, the um, Law Review organizers. This is a, an amazing event, and I feel so grateful to be a part of it. Um, I want to um, tell you by introduction first, I'm a social psychologist by training, as Laura Gomez mentioned. Um, this is work in collaboration with my PhD student in the Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program at UC Berkeley. Her name is Selena Romano, and she's a full partner in, um, in this project. And we're taking a psychological look at the question of Latino racialization. So why psychology? Um, yes, we certainly learn so much from so many other fields, um, possibly even more. Uh, than from psychology, but through a psychological lens, what we can do is reveal how individual minds classify and stereotype people and how they do this in ways that rationalize attitudes and behaviors and protect their own self and their own group and the system. Um, it's an incomplete picture, but it's useful for highlighting some key mechanisms and revealing ethnocentric biases. There's I should say a dearth of social psychology on Latinx communities. Um, and by dearth, um, here's one example. There was a, uh, someone in 1988 took a look at 17 social psychology textbooks and out of hundreds of studies on prejudice and stereotyping and intergroup relations, only four were on Latinos. Um, and a more recent look at top psychology journals um, finds a, a similar problem. The, um, nevertheless, um, Devin Carbato and your faculty organizers um, uh, compelled me to uh, dive into whatever literature I could find uh, in psychology. We turned over every single stone um, that we could. Um, and I'd like to, um, to talk a little bit about some major themes that, uh, that were revealed. Um, I want to note uh, that, first of all, this is literature from about the 1990s on, and also that practically none of it takes an intersectional lens. Um, it either is unspecified uh, about Latinos, a lot of it is about Latinos slash immigration, um, and uh, some, and mo or it's on um, men. Um, Okay, so one of the things revealed by the literature is some major markers of Latino racialization. So one of them is accent. Um, accent is used as a marker for Latino-ness um, and in particular as a marker of competence. Um, another study revealed that Spanish-accented people were judged to be more difficult to comprehend than other accented people. And white participants' subjective sense of comprehending the person did not match their actual comprehension. So they, they said that they weren't comprehending, but that didn't match whether they actually comprehended. What was even more interesting about this study was that uh, the higher these participants were in their desire to maintain the social hierarchy and dominance, the more they judged a Latino person with an accent as difficult to comprehend. So that's accent, language um, as well. Um, there's um, a study showing that a quote unquote by ethnic Latino, someone who identified as white and Latino, uh, was judged to be more Latino if he spoke Spanish. Uh, for the mono-ethnic Latino, it didn't matter. Uh, skin tone is another one uh, found, not obviously not just in psychology. Uh, darker skin is used to mark someone both as more Latino and as more of an immigrant. Um, there's also occupation and class and there's legal status. I wanna highlight a couple of themes here. One of them is that this suggests that Latino-ness is very contingent. Um, and others have written about this, including Laura Gomez, about contingent whiteness, probationary whiteness, uh, being a wedge group. Um, and these studies suggest that Latino classification as Latino can shift very easily depending on markers. Um, and then secondly, some of the markers are directly related to an, other, an othering as foreign. Um, and is affected by dominance concerns. Another set of the literature deals with stereotypes, and the stereotypes, um, uh, in one fascinating study, Latinos were judged to be less prototypically American, implicitly, not just explicitly, but implicitly, and more foreign than white Americans. Uh, in another interesting study, they compared different um, racialized minority groups in the US uh, on two dimensions, and, and white Americans, on two dimensions. One was the ethnic dimension, another one was a civic dimension. And what they found was that Latinos were 
uh, seen as uh, less American than African Americans on the civic dimension, but not on the ethnic dimension. And both of those groups were seen as less American than white Americans. Um, the, uh, and that, I think, has implications for, um, important implications for criminal justice and, and punitive sentiment. Um, obviously, uh, stereotypes also abound about um, Latinos as criminal and violent, drug, drug dealers, uh, gangsters, lawbreakers. Um, this is reflected in our media as well. Um, but I, in looking at the literature, would suggest that this is actually an unstable stereotype. And you find it sometimes, and you don't find it other times. Um, there's also stereotypes around occupation and also around being uneducated um, or lazy. I'll talk, come back to that in a second. And then a variety of culturally deviant traits uh, that contribute to perceived criminality or population growth that, um, that don't have to do with the ones that I said before. Um, there's also dehumanized representations. I highly recommend Otto Santa Ana's book on um, brown tide rising, so um, dehumanized representations like waves, um, hordes, disease, insects, dogs uh, that have been used in political rhetoric. Um, a couple of things uh, about the stereotyping literature. One, again, there's this theme of Latinos as foreign and un-American. Um, and again, uh, there's some ambiguity and instability in the stereotypes. So for example, criminal doesn't always show up. Um, Latinos are hardworking but lazy in these, um, uh, in these studies. Uh, and then uh, they're family oriented, but they're not warm. Um, so this instability and ambiguity I think is very important. Um, the next uh, bucket is the psychology of threat. And a lot of this has been done with respect to immigration in particular, with respect to Latinos. Um, so threats uh, that whites perceive to their culture and identity, including national identity, threats around resources, threats to the dominant group standing, threats to uh, feeling like you're no longer, that, uh, that's called prototypicality threat, feeling like you're no longer going to be the prototypical American. And these have been shown in numerous studies, well, I shouldn't say numerous, a handful of studies uh, for Latinos to provoke anti-Latinx prejudice, negative attitudes towards Mexicans and Cubans, and Latinos more generally, anti-immigration sentiment, um, support for conservative policies, desire for assimilation, um, uh, and uh, a study by political scientists showing that criminal threat and um, economic threat both predict punitive Latino sentiment, and the effect of criminal threat on sentiment is larger in Latino um, growth areas, in larger Latino growth areas. So from the analyses above, it seems like criminal stereotypes and threat can affect punitiveness. Um, but also there's this cultural and national identity dimension that might lead to leveraging criminality in an effort to exclude. And this is important for both the criminal justice system and immigration. Um, so I'll just tell you briefly about um, some studies that highlight this. Uh, one of them showed the ethnocentric leveraging of criminality to oppose immigration. So participants read about an immigrant who was Mexican and committed a misdemeanor, had several park unpaid parking tickets, or about a Canadian uh, who had committed the same misdemeanor. And participants had harsher immigration attitudes uh, when they read about the Mexican than the, when they read about the Canadian immigrant um, when, the, uh, when he had a, a criminal background. And what this suggests is that participants were using that misdemeanor to justify their negative attitudes. So there was a process, an important process, process of justification that then they could say had nothing to do with race and had everything to do with cr the crime that had been committed. Um, another study, an undocumented detainee was treated more punitively and tough treatment was seen as more fair by white Americans when he was Mexican than a Canadian of any status. And this per per pattern was particularly strong among those, those white Americans with strong Anglo-centric national identity. Um, and then finally, uh, being in the country illegally, working under the table and having a non-US flag outside your home, these are all um, experimental uh, cues from this study, uh, were all seen by non-Latino whites as a more serious violation if the actor was Mexican versus Canadian. 
uh, and that evaluation of violation seriousness fueled negative immigration attitudes. Okay, so to conclude, um, what lessons do we see from the literal literature that exists in psychology on these issues? One is the ambiguity and instability of these uh, processes, this contingent whiteness, honorary whiteness. Um, two, that ethnocentric bias and punitive sentiment is revealed in a way that is very much tied to protecting culture and national identity and dominance. Three, that people are very good at justifying punitive behavior and attitudes and coming up with reasons that they can tell themselves are not ethnocentric. Thank you. Okay, that was fabulous, and I'm still writing down my notes furiously. Um, hi, I'm Kelly, and I came in here today with a whole lot of questions about this issue in particular, which I have been studying um, the Latinx community and criminal justice for about two decades now, and I still have more questions than I have answers. And I have to say that the two presentations already, I'm sure the third to come, have already, I think, enlightened me greatly, so I'm very thankful for being here today. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm one of the scholars who has been pushing to make sure that when we talk about mass incarceration, we talk about black and brown mass incarceration, and that we really think through in specific and concrete ways what is the Latinx dimension of this story. I've been doing that work for a long time. Um, so I have written books on immigration law enforcement and border enforcement and how thinking about Latinx populations amplifies and enhances our understanding of the criminal justice system writ large. I have thought mostly historically about these issues, but in recent years have launched a new project called Million Dollar Hoods, which is much more of a contemporary project that is mapping the cost of incarceration here in Los Angeles and looking at the particular trends of policing. In that work that we've been doing at Million Dollar Hoods, and Jennifer Quintero, who is an undergraduate member of the MDH team, put your hand up. There she is. Um, yes, all right. One of the things that we have found in that work is something that's actually becoming much more well known is that there are very few disparities in arrests for Latinx populations. So let me just go through some of the research really quickly and then raise the questions that I think that this forces us as researchers to begin to ask. So both at Million Dollar Hoods and in a recent report that came out from PPIC, new insights into California arrests, trends, disparities, and county differences, I encourage everybody to take a look at that. We see that in 2016, Latinos were just slightly overrepresented in all arrests in California. So Latinos are 39% of the California population, but 41% of all arrests in the state of California. You can compare this to African Americans, who are 6% of the state population, but 16% of all the arrests. And for white folks, it's slightly underrepresented in arrests. What's and also important to note from this report is that in 1980, when Latinos were 19% of the state of California, they comprised 26% of all arrests. So what we have seen over the last 20 to 30 years is actually a downward trend in terms of the disparities of Latino arrests in the state of California. That was surprising to me. Um, today, the Latino arrest rate is just about 1.1 times the, wh the white arrest rate. And this is pretty consistent across the state. In the vast majority of counties that are studied in this report, Latinx populations actually are underrepresented in arrest trends. This is also true for the jurisdictions that we have been looking at through the Million Dollar Hoods team. Los Angeles, Kern County, San Diego in particular, Latinx populations are arrested at their, at their per capita rate or below it. So Kern County, we were able to just clean up that data recently, and it's quite surprising. The Latinx population in Kern County, which we know to be um, retrograde at this moment in time, in particular in the issue of criminal justice and police shootings, Latinx populations are underrepresented in the local arrests. This was stunning to us. So Looking at this data and understanding the declining and relatively low Latino arrest rate, I think we've got to start asking some questions about what is happening here. Um, 
we at Million Dollar Hoods have been looking for some meaningful trends within the Latino arrest patterns. Uh, we asked the question is, when Latinos live closer to African Americans, do their arrest rates go up, right? So this is a racial proximity question. No, it's completely scattershot across the, the county of Los Angeles in particular. It does not matter where Latinos live, the arrest rate remains fairly stable. Um, are Latinx arrest rates higher among peak youth populations? 18 to 28 is where most arrests happen anyway. Um, Latino population tends to be younger. So are they clustered in that age group? No, the arrest rate is about the same um, in that youth population. Are there specific charge trends that illuminate Latinx engagements with the criminal justice system here in Los Angeles, Kern County, San Diego in particular? Again, no, there's no particular charge that is sweeping Latinx populations into the criminal justice system that is separate and different from um, general trends or African American trends in particular. Um, are arrests officer dependent? And we haven't actually investigated this, but listening to you, I think we need to do that work and think about the social psychology that might be in with individual officers who might be ratcheting up some forms of arrest. So we will go and do that work. Um, so there's a, a bit of a issue here that I have been advocating for black and brown analyses of mass incarceration. I think it's, we have all of this incredible work that Matt Barreto is doing. We know the Latinx populations are feeling impacted by the criminal justice system. And I would agree that that's absolutely true. But the question is how and where and when. Um, so I think that we need to start looking for the contextual and qualitative measures of what is happening. This is not a quantitative story for Latinx populations, it's a qualitative and contextual story. So I think what we have just heard in, in some ways about the importance of immigration and the specter of deportation within um, individual lives, but also within mixed families and communities, amplifies the consequences of any potential uh, contact with law enforcement. And so that's part of this importance of talking about black and brown uh, when we talk about mass incarceration. Um, we will soon get more stop data from the RIPA board, and I know we have people here who have been advocating for the RIPA board to be very comprehensive in its data collection. I wonder if at the stop level that does not accelerate to arrest, that Latinx populations are experiencing high levels of police harassment that might help us to understand all of this. But in this room, in this family, that's, I would. Latino majority, I really want us to engage in this conversation about the lack of disparities, what that means, and what it doesn't mean. And I think that's important to happen first within community, within family, and then we gotta take this research outward to think about how the particular trends for Latinx populations help us to understand what's happening writ large within the criminal justice system, and that it's something separate from the question of disparities, which is how we typically talk about the problem of mass incarceration. So thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here, so uh, thank you all for sharing your um, data, your findings. Um, I was thinking, you know, my cousin, when he was a teenager, he was drinking along uh, the lakefront with his friends in, like, bags, and they thought they were all cool. And um, Ruben was stopped by an off-duty officer, and they put guns to their heads. Um, they intimidated them, and I remember thinking beyond the trauma that he went through, and he did have PTSD after, I remember thinking we don't have data on that encounter. That's an invisible encounter. It's almost like a, for social scientists, that didn't exist, but it existed, and his life was impacted. Um, it, so I, you know, I think this will be an interesting and fruitful dialogue, and maybe this idea about qualitative. I want to talk a little bit about um, the findings from Crook County, which is the book that I worked on for over a decade and tried to inter, uh, interview and innovate and do ethnography and try to push the boundaries of qualitative work. And thank you to Laura Gomez who um, matched me with a publisher because when I pitched a book on racism in the criminal courts, I literally had a top publisher say, we'll take a book about the courts, but this race stuff, we don't really, 
I, I don't get it. And I remember thinking, well, am I supposed to censor all the findings? Like, what? what's left? There literally be 10 pages. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's even a telling finding, that it was hard to get a publisher to invest in a project that would acknowledge racism as an overt process. So I'm not going to talk about the implicit parts. I'm going to talk about the overt parts today and the types of racial tropes that are mobilized within court communities, by judges, by prosecutors, that help them make sense of their case volume and their caseload. And I want to end, hopefully I have enough time, to talk a little bit about um, the kind of international tropes that extend beyond institutions across them. Um, so in my findings in Crook County, I talk about kind of an adjacent racialization, so that blacks, black defendants are in some ways the reference category for the racialization of Latinos. They're kind of subsumed into the category, but they experience um, kind of a different, uh, a, a race-specific type of degradation. So I talk about the notion of illegal. My, my uncle, uh, my uncle George always goes, hey, I just look illegal, man. That's why this happens to me all the time. Because he talks about getting stopped in Texas. And it, you know, he, he jokes about it as like, I can never take off this skin, this face, this posture. Um, you know, he's an OG, the, the retired uh, kind of uh, 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 guy that you know, takes pride in his you know, aesthetic, his kind of cholo aesthetic. But he also knows that it makes him more vulnerable. And so he says that it, it just, you know, it makes me look illegal. And so, you know, this notion of illegal conflates one's kind of contested citizenship with a presupposition that you are criminal. And so, you know, I, I treat race in my work um, is kind of being inspired by what law and society folks have called empirical critical race theory with lots of scholars coming from UCLA law, um, law and society tradition, where we think about race being kind of mutually constitutive so that race um, and criminal justice apparatuses kind of create each other and inspire each other. So criminal justice uh, apparatuses create categories of race, create racial stigmas. Um, one of the ways that I, I try to innovate about how we understand race and racism in the criminal justice system is to think um, about how do we measure it. And so, you know, you have to imagine me starting a project on racism in the criminal justice system, and I'd had advisors say, well, how are you going to measure that? It was like saying, how are you going to find a unicorn? <laughs> um, it, was, it was something that seemed so elusive. So what I did was I did extended ethnography. I used my own um, racial identity as a very light-skinned Chicana that uh, was at a high status institution, so I was very assumed to be white. I had the privilege of hearing how whites understand and talk about uh, racial classification when they think a person of color is not in the room. And that changes everything, right? Um, I was able to do 105 interviews with prosecutors, judges, um, and defense attorneys. I had them uh, conducted by young white women because I knew that race mattered. And so again, uh, you know, the, the judges and prosecutors were able to talk in these kind of unveiled ways. Uh, and then finally, to make sure that people understood that the stigmas we saw in the courtrooms were not based on class stigma. Um, I had 130 research assistants from law schools around the Chicago area go into the Crook County uh, courts, all 25 of them, and do um, court observations in a semi-structured form so they can test race. So they were both kind of, they were audit testing their own racial identity and how they were treated when they were dressed down. So they were certainly not dressed in any social markers like suits, the way lots of uh, law interns and clerks want to look. Right? It was actually a struggle to force them to strip away their class and education identities. I was like, no, stop wearing a tie. No, just wear a hoodie because people can't afford you know, uh, suits when they come to court. Right? They're already strapped for cash. They're already strapped to pay their attorneys. Um, and what we found was that you know, there was a, a prevailing uh, conception about how people thought, uh, how those professionals thought about defendants. They called them mopes. Um, it's a lazy, degenerate de offender who has crossed the boundaries into criminality. So in some ways, their own degenerate status has pushed them into the criminal justice system. Um, it was both a criminal charge. So if you say, well, what do mopes do? They had a whole set of criminal offenses that meant that you were mope. And it meant you were largely nonviolent, but you were, you were punishable because you were overburdening the criminal justice system with your pathology. Um, one probation officer said, I said to him, what, what's a mope? And he says, 
Oh man, you see that guy right there? You see that guy? Why did Judge be like that, man? So he actually flips into a bonnex. He says, if all I had to do was report to probation and do community service, I would. When you roll around in shit, you start to become shit. Putting some of these guys on probation is like throwing trash in the ocean. This guy's a piece of shit. He'll be back. So they actually even understand criminal justice concepts like recidivism through this racialized lens of objectification, calling them animals, calling them this kind of grotesque language. And what they do in, as part of the due process is they start to circumvent people's rights and due process procedures. And they use these kind of racialized tropes to explain away why they don't really deserve a translator or why they don't deserve a trial or the ability to speak. I call this uh, racial degradation ceremonies where they actually try to ritually destroy people in public and on the court record where it transforms the defendant as a social actor and withers away their status um, so that they are marginalized and separate from the social body. And in some ways creates a shared performance among court actors, judges, and prosecutors to kind of have a shared identity, like look at this guy, look at this mope, look at this trash, let's perform the ceremony together. Um, for black defendants, uh, it sounded, you know, it had a particular texture, but I want to take you to the race-specific degradation of Latinos. Um, this was a man who um, was supposed to come into court for sentencing, and his attorney didn't show up. And so in some ways, this was kind of a moral of a violation. So for being lazy and not having his attorney there, he ended up, he ends up getting punished. The judge says, where is your attorney? Why aren't you talking? And the defendant says, I, I don't speak English. And he says, me don't speak English. He says it in this broken way. The judge says, if you're pretending that you can't speak English, you will be held in contempt. The judge said to the interpreter in front of everybody uh, so the gallery could hear, seems the defendant forgot how to speak his English. Me no speak English. So he asks him, where is your attorney now through a translator? He's not here. Thank you. Where is he? How do you get in touch with them? So at this point, the judge is standing and looking down and actually screaming at the defendant in open court. The defendant says, well, my wife does that for me. And so then um, off the record, but to the entire gallery, the judge says, it's Flora plea today. No wonder why someone forgot how to speak his English. Looks like he was walking like he had his toenails extracted. So the violence of this language, right, once they, the racial trope uh, becomes a salient category to understand criminal charges and criminal racial beings, a whole host of abuse, uh, unprofessional behavior, berating, a, a true ceremony of sorts for onlookers to see and gaze at becomes a type of performance that's integrated into due process. It, it, it is a Latino defendant's actual day in court. It is their justice or injustice. And I think the racial spectacle of it all, to me, feels the most upsetting. Um, in my other work, um, I do an article with Armando Larmian, and we talk about, we wanted to make sure people didn't understand these as local tropes, meaning we didn't want critics to say, oh, these are just racial prejudices in a court that's gone wrong. People want to explain away racism that way. That's not how cultural theorists or cultural sociologists think about race. Culture transcends institution, right? So we talk about the idea of being lazy, right? That there's the theme of that is in the, in the word mope. And in other jurisdictions, they might use a different term, but the word or the concept is still the same. And so one of the things that we've done in our work, our shared work, is looking how the mope trope translates to two different institutions across jurisdiction. So we do comparative ethnography that looks how the racialized trope imposed on defendants, um, including Latinos, is used in courts, and then how it is used in local jails to depopulate the jail. Um, and that, to me, feels like a very powerful strategy, which is how can we innovate on qualitative methods to extend claims of generalizability and truly make research um, more powerful? And what I think I don't have time to talk about today is this idea of new tropes that I see manifesting in the global uh, refugee crisis. Um, in jails, John Irwin did a famous study talking about rabble, 
uh, which was this idea that jails served a purpose to circulate the undesirables in and out, right? You can arrest someone, hold them in jail for a decent amount of time, and then release them, even if you drop the charges, like you're literally changing people's lives. And in some ways, thinking about that as a strategic move by the state to not have to help people, right? To not give them social services. When they become a social problem, you scoop them in that jail, you detain them, you charge them, you mark them, you criminalize. And so I, I you know, I'm playing with this idea of how is the global migrant crisis as a humanitarian crisis, how is it racialized in the United States and becoming a new type of trope that we see translating across institutions, across criminal justice, across jails, across um, and across immigration courts and immigration detention centers. What I'd like to hear more from all, all of us today is how these institutions are shared, cultural logics and people in some ways are, we have to think about those shared logics and how they influence each other. Thank you. What a wonderful, what a wonderful way to start the the conference with with just this this setting of this um, of this table as we move forward. Uh, really wonderful. I'm going to start. I have a couple of questions that I want to throw back to you guys, and and I'd love it if each of you might just give a, a quick response. So the first question is really the question that I think Kelly you raised, but it is one issue that goes through all of the the literature across all of these disciplines. Um, and that is the question of this, this, you know, when you look at the data, why is it that you don't see that great overrepresentation, right? Um, so I have a, a, a one observation and then a, a hypothesis that I'd like you guys to react to. The observation is that the dynamics of over and under representation that that and this is something that those of you who are more expert in in uh, uh, measurement and statistics than than I am can address but those dynamics of over and under representation may not be as may not be work the same way when you have such a large population group right so when we have Latinos being 40 percent of the California population versus um, six percent for African Americans. I just wonder if that's the right metric. Um, but here's the question, I, the hypothesis that I want to put out there. So we have learned in data from other um, other areas like education, health, that there is when we start looking in depth and disaggregating the category of Latinos, and in particular looking at generation, right, generation U.S we have learned that there is a, a, what's called sometimes an immigrant paradox. And that is that immigrants actually do better on most of these measures, um, perhaps paradoxically, because they have, you know, they, they have been, I mean, you know, I always say, gosh, immigrants are so motivated, right? And the children are so motiv motivated, but, but me and my cousins who are like fourth generation, you know, we're, well, okay, I might be an exception, but um, most uh, of us are not that motivated to really uh, get out there. And so I would really want to see, and I'm wondering if any of you have seen in your research um, what those numbers look like if we take generation into account. And so, um, you, you, Kelly, you were nodding your head, so maybe we can just start at that end and move um, back this way. I just think those are really good questions that we can actually empirically test. Yes. So we could think about, um, and I'm talking to the Million Dollar Hoods team here, we could think about the arrest rates in neighborhoods that are much more immigrant heavy than second and third generation, see what happens to the arrest rates at that level. So I'm just saying I could follow up on that. I, I fiercely believe there is a story here. We just don't know what it is yet. And so this question about immigration status and generation, um, I'm really open to hearing what other people would like to see us query on all of this. Um, so, I, so a few thoughts. Um, first of all, the, uh, there is so much um, complexity around how we count people in the first place mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. in this country and in this state. Um, and so I think we need to think about that when it's it, there's nothing natural or neutral about 
these classifications. And so I mm -hmm. think the f one first step might be to think to think that through. Um, what do we mean by uh, Latinos in, in these statistics? Mm -hmm. And what do we mean by the other groups? And how do they overlap? Um, another one is, um, I think it relates to what Kelly was saying, that um, over you, you might find, a, when I talked about the markers, I think that makes me think that you might find that you have to break up the numbers more. You mm -hmm. have to look at interactions with, um, with other characteristics. Um, they might be some of the ones that, uh, that Kelly mentioned. You might find underrepresentation on some and overrepresentation on others um, if you do a more nuanced analysis. And I mean, then, like looking at different offenses or the different stages of interaction with police. Uh, different stages of interaction with police, um, but also different types of communities, uh, different... Um, Just variation in general. Variation okay. in, um, uh, in, uh, in uh, say, heritage or skin tone, national origin, yeah. um, time of, closeness to time of arrival. I, mean, there's, I think there's many, many ways to cut up the data, um, and I can't say that I'm an expert in, uh, in what those should be. Um, and then finally, uh, I think that uh, one of the things that, that that statistic makes me think of is in the um, literature that I was reading on uh, civic versus ethnic uh, prototypicality of Latinos versus other groups, one of the scholars makes the point that when you deviate from whiteness in a more on, along an ethnic dimension um, and there's uh, criminal stereotypes about your group, that the punishment is swift and direct. Um, it's a very direct route. Uh, but for a group where there might be some ethnic variation, but they differ more on the, the civic one, then it might be more indirect. There are other ways in which people are being excluded, harassed, um, or treated punitively that need to be looked up to. Nicole? You know, I, you know, my vantage point on the system is through the eyes of the mostly white professionals. And so, you know, racism is kind of sloppy and lazy. <laughs> I mean, that's the irony. <laughs> Meaning um, it, the, your generation status didn't protect you from being subsumed into these categories, these kind of racist categories. For instance, um, you know, in the, in the jail study, uh, having uh, tattoos, having a cholo aesthetic, automatically labeled you, for instance, as gang affiliated. And so, you know, Armando Larmian would probe, like, well, why do you have more evidence? Like, do you have, you know, is there history? Do you see actual gang tattoos? And they're like, no, we, we've seen this guy. So they were using kind of racial markers on the body um, that didn't necessarily have anything to do with criminality, but more about their cultural identity um, to label and and it's so it's unclear it didn't seem like the generation for instance Generation status had anything to do with it because if you have that marker right then like my cousin right? He's you know our grandfather was born in this country, right? We're Chicanos. We've been here for generations now But yet that doesn't save him from that type of police encounter that is then not reflected in any data set in criminal justice so um, I think those are great questions uh, Laura and uh, the first thing I would say is that I think something everyone agrees with is that there's not enough <clears throat> reliable or mm -hmm. consistent data uh, on Latino arrests or anything in the criminal justice system. Um, this is something that we know is a ma uh, major problem. Mm -hmm. uh, California might be better than some states on some of the data, but even then, it's not as consistent. We know that race is um, codified in the minds of law enforcement uh, as one that goes uh, back to black populations. Mm -hmm. And so they perhaps do a better job of uh, identifying both in over-arresting but also in identifying mm -hmm. uh, for processing purposes uh, African Americans. And so we just need better data, number one, to understand uh, the Latino experience. And I think nationally, and, and if we can work with law enforcement in California, where it, which it is a more uh, progressive data state, um, that, that would be helpful. Uh, two, I would say that there's some role of representation in this. So we should take some, um, you know, satisfaction in some of the uh, data that uh, Kelly is talking mm -hmm. about in that California has closed the gap, the over-representation gap uh, from when Latinos were a smaller population. Mm -hmm. This also coincides with a dramatic increase in mm -hmm. Latino elected officials mm -hmm. in Sacramento when term limits went out. We now have had Latino um, uh, House speakers, uh, Senate majority leaders, um, statewide elected officials, uh, many more city council members. 
et cetera. And so I think you're seeing a transformation in California, and that might be something to study. There's a lot of political science studies on the role of representation when you have Latino sheriffs, when you have uh, Latino statewide elected officials, when you have others looking over the shoulders of these folks, maybe they do a better job. And that's maybe something we can pull out to compare what we know was happening in, say, uh, Maricopa County, uh, where the sheriff was mm -hmm. explicitly racially profiling um, Latinos uh, and admitted as much, mm -hmm. then maybe we have better practices in California so we, so we can think about that. <clears throat> I, I also think there is a lot of truth into the uh, generational analysis and that we know from a lot of published studies that have been coming out around the sanctuary city debate, immigrants, regardless of status, are far less likely to have interactions with law enforcement than are US born, regardless of race. So there is absolute truth that immigrants, um, especially as they get into more, uh, less permanent status, mm -hmm. are steering clear of any interactions uh, with law enforcement. And um, there's been papers published by some of my colleagues, uh, Lauren Collingwood and Ben Gonzalez, uh, on this, showing that in sanctuary cities, there's far less crime and that in particular in high density undocumented communities, there's far less arrests, right? People are trying to stay away from police in these areas because of their status. Uh, and so we would expect that. We might see a, uh, an up, a blip up if we did an analysis of second gen US borns mm -hmm. versus the number mm -hmm. of second gen US borns getting arrested. And then finally on this data point, we also wanna be looking in federal data yeah. because when uh, immigrants are getting uh, encountered, um, they might be getting, um, initially picked up, and they might be getting turned over, that may not show up as an arrest in the sheriff or the police data, but that might show up as a detention in the ICE data. And so there's other places that we can look for this, uh, and I think that, that, you know, that sort of helps contribute to that conversation. Terrific responses. I'm gonna ask one more question in my prerogative as a moderator, and it's one that was actually surfaced in the responses. Um, it has to do with, you know, you know, actually, Nicole, you gave us a very vivid, uh, contemporary uh, notion of this in-betweenness that Latinos can occupy, right? So you talked about, you know, you could, you could pass in a sense because you have, you know, you could use one name or not the other name and, and because of your fair skin and so forth. And also gender, right? You didn't talk about this too much, but the fact that you and these females could have a certain a certain kind of entree, right, that men would not have even um, if, if they were raised in a certain way. And um, that in between us is, is something, as Vicki mentioned, I have written about historically um, in, in, in later, later eras, um, just taking you back to the pre-World War II, mid 20th century moment, we see this play out in uh, cases like Hernandez versus Texas, right? Um, 1954 Supreme Court case. And in that case, there was this, this dilemma that the Chicano attorneys uh, for the uh, defendant faced, which is we want to get the protection of the Equal Protection Amendment of the 14th Amendment, but we don't want to give up that that legal fiction that we're white, mm -hmm. right? And that that dilemma um, almost cost them the win, but in the end didn't because the justices um, uh, said, "Well, you know, uh, you are you are another class of people, and the the equal protection clause is not limited to just you know two groups, uh, black." Uh, or is not just to protect blacks and and so forth. So I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details of that. But if you fast forward to another historical moment, uh, one that I'm writing about now, which is thinking about uh, 1980, which is the first time that we have any federal data collecting nationwide data about this category of Hispanic uh, Latino. And, and that, I think, is that that move if you if you you know follow this literature which i know many of you do was to treat latino latinos and hispanics as an ethnic group right not as a racial category and so you get that bifold category and you get the rise of the term you know non-hispanic whites right because well we know they're they're not really white but we'll call these other people non-hispanic whites and so 
it begs the question of how we count. And when I last looked at how Florida was counting Latinos, for example, they were counting them in their criminal justice data as white. Um, so there's a lot of national variation, as you said, Matt. And I just wonder, um, you know, and this is something I think we will be talking about all day, is what the data sources are, who's included and who's not included. I was wondering in the data that we were, were thinking about for California and in other states this would be uh, even more critical, what is happening with Afro-Latinos, right? And where are they being counted and not counted? And what is the basis for this data collection, right? So, so I don't know, we can start with you, Matt, if you have, and we'll go that way. And just if you each have like a couple of minutes, like literally two minutes to just give some thoughts. Yeah, I won't say too much more since I already touched on the data. I mean, I think that the data question is, uh, as someone who works with data, is very important. I mean, we, can, we, we need to constantly be um, bringing in the sort of uh, qualitative accounts of what's happening so we can understand that. But at some point, uh, in order to uh, show these disparities, we, we need to be able to identify them in the data. And so there's been an, a sort of a larger trend, sort of two trends, some trends in, in progressive states of trying to have more data access and more accountability, but in other states, they're sweeping data under the rug and making it harder for us to get. So the more that we can do uh, to push for reforms and just understanding what is happening, how people are being classified, allowing people to self-identify uh, their race or ethnicity at time of um, uh, involvement with a criminal justice uh, official. Uh, things like that, I think, will just help us be able to then unpack and understand uh, what's happening so that we can then uh, change and advocate for different policy uh, prescriptions to know where there there's more of an issue. Um, but it is very uneven nationally. There's been a couple of national reports on this showing you know, just how uh, poor the data quality is in, in some places of even understanding how many Latinos are even interacting with the criminal justice system. Um, you know, it's interesting because you're talking about something happening up way up here, and I'm talking about the state court, circuit court experience, and in law and society we talk about the disjuncture between law in the books and law in action. So I'm in the realm of action, right? And so I'm, and I'm in the thick of it. Um, when we think about that judge and how the judge was, you know, a berating and, and degrading um, uh, the Latino defendant, it, you know, there was no favors for Latinos. Like the category in that area is firm. You are not white, right? You are part, I mean, and I think this is where the criminal justice system is a race-making machine because if you are subsumed into that mope category, you are adjacent, if not the same as blacks in many different ways, but we'll figure out a way to degrade you specific to your culture. But, but you could be white in that but, setting. And I think this is where I loved playing with that, and I have the privilege of playing with that, which is as a Northwestern student, right, as someone um, you know, who could code switch, I was able to navigate those identities and feel like I was in a cloak, right, that I could actually explore and probe those. If you cannot take that cloak off, you will be subsumed into that racialized, right? So status and education and all those factors had a lot to do with it. I also think that the prejudice of gender um, in that boys network was really helpful mm -hmm. in a really uh, paradoxical way. They assumed me not to be, um, I don't know, a threat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so when I realized that they saw me in that non-threatening way or they were you know sexually harassing me or you know flirting with me i just kind of doubled down on it I was like oh tell me more about a mope hmm you know and i did the the girl thing and 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 the candidness of responses right because i'm speaking the local cultural language of white male prosecutors mm -hmm. and that to me helped you know put me on the right side to then gain access to understand how latinos uh, mostly of less education, more poverty, et cetera, were then able to be racialized adjacent to blacks, right? So, um, but I think this is almost like a perfect case study in the law and the books and law and yes. action. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so on the question of, um, of counting and counting Counting issues, or, or fluidity. Yeah, so the fluidity I already your, talked about. Yes. Um, I already touched on that quite a bit, so I'll, I'll touch on the, the counting part. Um, one of them is that we know um, from personal experiences, even those that have been shared today, um, from political science work, from psychology work, that how you identify can be very different from how you're 
how you're perceived. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, yeah, self-identification might get us somewhere, but perceptions might get us mm -hmm. further. But then that runs into the question of who is doing the classifying. If you're basing it on perceptions, who is the perceiver? Um, and we know from work in other areas and other identities um, that uh, uh, legal officials can, uh, the, the categories that they might classify someone as might, might deviate wildly from how someone identifies or uh, may be motivated uh, uh, in certain ways. Um, and then uh, in terms of what is not being collected, uh, uh, Judge Mark Bennett and I wrote an article that came out, um, I guess, last year in um, UC Davis Law Review on skin tone and Afrocentric mm -hmm. facial features and criminal sentencing of African Americans. And one of the things that we noticed is there were so few studies in part because it's data that's not being collected uh, on something like skin tone. So again, I think we need to look at some of these other markers and make sure that those data are being collected too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, data is not queen, right? It is problematic in a bazillion different ways. Um, and I think this question of racial classification, the Latinos, um, historically speaking, contemporaries, is, is really important and well, the perceiver. Um, and that's what the Ripper Board data will give us. Uh, I just want to, I know that this is a very difficult conversation and talking about this disparity issue is very um, provocative in some ways, but I think it's really important we tackle it in community first before we take it out. Um, in terms of California, the data's pretty good. It's as far as nationally speaking, the data in California is pretty good and we're seeing the same trends across city and county regardless of size of population. So there's something there that we need to talk about. I think what's clear though, regardless of the city, the county, or the state, is that what we are seeing is that with a consistent underrepresentation of white folks, white supremacy is at play. Mm -hmm. What we see clearly is that white folks are under impacted by the criminal justice system, which is operating at a scale that is so massive that regardless of the disparities, all of our communities, Latinx, black, and native in particular, are being um, deeply damaged by what is happening in ways that's not impacting white communities. So that I think is one of the final lessons here. With that known, I would love to better understand what's happening with Latinx communities and the qualitative research I think in line with the uh, quantitative is absolutely critical. Please join me in thanking our wonderful scholars who started us off today.